And so today we're going to continue a series of studies that I have begun making our case for Yeshua the Messiah. And we're looking at the reasons why we as Messianic Jews believe that Yeshua is really the Messiah of Israel. And so we've been looking at Messianic prophecies for the most part, and uh, we'll also have some testimonies coming up very soon as well. And we are answering objections to faith in Yeshua as the Messiah, Jewish objections. So really this is a time of uh, training and learning for those of us who are believers, learning to be able to share our faith openly and confidently and to be able to answer objections. This series is also about reaching out to our Jewish people, letting them know that Yeshua is our Messiah, and uh, to be able to study the Scriptures together with us and to find out for yourself if it is true. Because if Yeshua is the Messiah, it must be true from the Scriptures, from the Tanakh. And so through the pages of the Tanakh, throughout the Hebrew Scriptures, there are these predictions concerning the Messiah and uh, concerning the, the coming one. And uh, the Messiah is one who would come to reverse the effects of the fall and who would come and fulfill God's plan of redemption for Israel and the nations. And so these Messianic prophecies are like identifying credentials of the Messiah. So we can tell the real Messiah, biblically, and that we can also tell him apart from all the Messiah wannabes. Now, of course, as Messianic Jews, we believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, and he fulfills all that, the, that Moses and the prophets wrote about. And uh, our testimony is the same as the first disciples of Yeshua, who are all Jews. And we read in the Scriptures in John chapter 1, verse 44, of how Philip found his friend Nathanael and said to him, We have found the one that Moses in the Torah and also the prophets wrote about, Yeshua of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Yeshua himself when teaching his disciples after the, uh, the resurrection, he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. Everything concerning me in the Torah of the prophets, sorry, everything written concerning me in the Torah and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. The three sections of the Hebrew scriptures, the prophets, uh, sorry, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings or the Psalms. And then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And that's our heart desire, is that God would open up our minds and lead us into spiritual truth. Today I'm going to start uh, to look at uh, a famous passage in the Scriptures, uh, Isaiah chapter 53. But of course, we, before we look at this passage, uh, we were going to see how Already we've ascertained from the Scriptures that the Messiah must be the seed of Abraham, uh, that he must be the seed of woman, and somehow also be uh, God in the flesh, that he must come in the tribe of Judah in, uh, from Israel, tribe of Judah, that he must come from King David's very own family line and must be born in the city of King David, Beit Lechem. And those were his family credentials. Today we're going to look at the Messiah's credentials of suffering, how the Messiah is predicted to suffer on behalf of the sins of the people. And so today we're going to look at uh, this prophecy of Isaiah 53, and uh, I've entitled my message today, and I'll continue this next week too, that he bore the sins of many, which is of course a quote from Isaiah 53, uh, 53 verse 12, because he poured out his soul to death, and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Today, today in this first part of the message, I'd like to answer the question, uh, various questions, and that first one is, who is Isaiah 53 talking about? And I'm going to answer a question, hopefully, does Judaism believe in a suffering Messiah? And also related to that question, why did the Messiah have to die? I hope to show that the prophet Isaiah was speaking about the Messiah and that this was accepted and understood by ancient Judaism. Consequently, I also hope to show that Judaism did in fact believe in a suffering Messiah. And then I hope to answer this question, why did Messiah have to die? Let's first read the full text of the prophecy 
which actually starts in Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13, until the end of chapter 53. Okay, so you've got your thinking hats on, and you've got your Bible open, or you're watching the screen. So let's get into the scriptures. Isaiah 52, verse 13. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. And has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see, uh, see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong." because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. What an amazing passage of Scripture that is. And uh, in fact, when my brother Alan first read that passage to me, I'd never heard it before. I didn't know where he was reading from. And uh, uh, after he had read the passage and I listened very carefully, I said to him, well, that is all about Jesus, isn't it? And that must be in the New Testament. So my brother showed me that he had read from the prophet Isaiah, who wrote 700 years before Jesus. And of course, I was stunned. But then, of course, in those days, I was unlearned, and I was just taking the passage at face value. And as I listened to it, I could not help myself but think of Jesus being the one who the prophet speaks about. So the question is, who is Isaiah speaking about? And that, of course, is the big question. Well, we know that he is called the servant of the Lord, or Evid Adonai. The prophecy actually begins in chapter 52, verse 13, Behold my servant. The main character in the prophecy is the servant of the Lord. So the more we know about the Hebrew idea of the servant, the better we'll understand the text. Who is the servant of the Lord? Is it Isaiah? Well, that's quite unlikely from the text. Is the servant to be ident identified with the uh, nation of Israel, with corporate Israel? Yes, in some instances, but not in all. Then who else could the servant of the Lord be? The servant of the Lord in Isaiah 53 must be understood in the light of a number of other passages that are usually called the servant songs of Isaiah. And these servant songs are found in uh, chapters 42 to 61. 
Scholars throughout the spectrum of biblical interpretation identify two primary possible servants, the Messiah and the nation of Israel. In the following passages, it seems that the prophet had the entire nation of Israel in mind. Isaiah chapter 41 verse 8, 43 verse 8, 44 verse 22, and following, and 48 verse 20. For instance, Isaiah 41 verse 8 says, But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend. Clearly here, the servant is Israel. On the other hand, a careful reading of Isaiah 42 verses 1 to 9, Isaiah 49 verse 1, Isaiah 49 verses 5 to 8, uh, 5 to 9 rather, and chapter 52 verse 13 to chapter 53 verse 12, which is the prophecy we're looking at today, demonstrates that the references to the servant of the Lord in these passages are to an individual, likely the Messiah himself. It's interesting that the Targum Pseudo-Jonathan, I'm going to refer to a lot of the Targums and Midrashim, the ancient Hebrew uh, and Jewish sources. The Targum Pseudo-Jonathan, when paraphrasing Isaiah 42 verse 2, says, Behold my servant the Messiah, I will draw him near, my chosen one in whom my memory is well pleased. And the medieval rabbi David Kimchi says about this verse, Behold my servant, this is King Messiah. Finally, there are a number of passages that could refer to a variety of choices for the servant of the Lord. These passages are found in Isaiah 49 verse 1, chapter 50 verses 4 to 11, and Isaiah 61 verses 1 to 4. The identity of the servant of the Lord, whether it is corporate Israel or an individual, is crucial to our understanding uh, and also uh, crucial to whether or not Yeshua is the fulfillment of this passage. If it can be demonstrated that the servant of the Lord in Isaiah 53 in particular is an individual and not a nation, then the case for Yeshua being the Messiah is far more tenable. So let's have a look at some of the rabbinic interpretations, the rabbinic interpretations of Isaiah chapter 53. What did the ancient sages say about the identity of the servant in Isaiah 53? Well, be to, to be sure and to be clear, many rabbis from ancient times have all believed that the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 53 was a prediction concerning an individual, namely the Messiah. Here are some quotes from rabbis or rabbinical sources that clearly show that they understood the passage messianically. There's an interesting discussion, in fact, in the Talmud about the Messiah's names. One rabbi said, the sick one is his name. For it is written, surely he has borne our sicknesses and carried our sorrows and pains, yet we considered him stricken, smitten, and afflicted by God. Sanhedrin 98b. Uh, I do apologize for the spelling mistake on the PowerPoint rabbinic interpretations. But here we're looking at what the rabbis have said, a quote from the Talmud. Here are also some verses from Isaiah's prophecy that's interpreted by ancient Jewish scholars as being messianic. Isaiah 52 verse 13. The scripture is, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. Well, the Targum Jonathan ben Uziel says, Behold, my servant Messiah shall prosper. So the Targum of Jonathan ben Uziel, dating uh, back to the first century AD, uh, was very heavily quoted by the early rabbis, and he was considered an authority on the Jewish view of Scripture. He definitely considered the Isaiah passage to be speaking about the Messiah. Also Targum's Yalchut and uh, 2, 3, 3, 8, and verse 7 says, He shall be exalted and extolled. He shall be higher than Abraham, higher than Moses, higher than the ministering angels. Very interesting quote uh, from a Jewish source about Isaiah 52, verse 13. Next week, we're going to look into these passages in a lot more detail. But let's look at Isaiah 53, verse 5. 
that says, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Midrash Konen in the 11th century says, Messiah, son of David, who loved Jerusalem, Elijah takes him by the head and says, You must bear his sufferings and wounds by which the Almighty chastises you for Israel's sins. And so it is written, He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. And the Midrash, of course, is a body of homiletic stories told by Jewish rabbis and sages to explain verses in the Tanakh. So this is Midrash Konen clearly says this verse speaks of the Messiah. Isaiah 53 verse 10. Let's have a look at that text. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Well, what does the Midrash Aseret Memrot say about this? The Messiah, in order to atone for them, for Adam and for David, he will make his soul a trespass offering as it is written. Again, another clear reference to the Messiah being the fulfillment of these verses. And then look at Isaiah 53 verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. The Talmud Sanhedrin 98a says, The Messiah, what is his name? Those of the house of Rabbi Yudah, the saints say, the sick one. As it is said, surely he has borne our sicknesses. Rabbi Don Yitzhak Abanel, who lived around the 1500s, while not accepting the view that the Isaiah passage is messianic, makes this dramatic admission. Let me quote to you. The first question is to ascertain to whom the scripture refers. For the learned among the Nazarenes, that's the Messianic Jews, expounded of the man who was crucified in Jerusalem at the end of the second temple, and who according to them was the Son of God and took flesh in the virgin's womb, as it is stated in their writings. Jonathan ben Uziel interpreted in the Targum of the future Messiah. But this is also the opinion of our learned men in the majority of the Midrashim. So, despite Abanel not accepting that this passage is messianic, he freely admits that the majority of the rabbis of the Midrashim took the passage to speak about the Messiah. Finally, let me also quote to you from the Zohar, the book of Jewish mysticism. Thought to have been written either by Simon ben Yochai in the second century or by a Spanish rabbi in the 13th century, a little bit debated. It makes certain uh, statements which have obvious references to Isaiah 53. And this is the text. There is in the Garden of Eden a palace called the Palace of the Sons of Sickness. This palace, the Messiah then enters and summons every sickness every pain and every chastisement of Israel. They all come and rest upon him, and were it not that he had thus lighted them off Israel and taken them upon himself, there had been no man able to bear Israel's chastisement for the transgression of the law. And this is that which is written, surely our sicknesses he had carried. The Zohar, this book that is revered about by Hasidic Judaism, uh, clearly connects Isaiah 53 with the Messiah. Furthermore, the Zohar recognizes the Messiah will take upon himself the sin and the sicknesses of Israel. The Messiah suffers for his people Israel. Isaiah 53 verse 5, let's look at that. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. The Zohar also says of this verse, The children of the world are members of one another. When the Holy One desires to give healing to the world, he smites, one, uh, he smites one just man among them, and for his sake heals all the rest. From where do we learn this? From the saying, He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. So again, very clearly in rabbinic Judaism, 
these texts are messianic. Another volume that takes uh, the, Messiah, uh, the Isaiah passage uh, uh, to refer to the Messiah is the Machsor prayer book, the prayer book that is used for Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. One of the many prayers found in uh, this prayer book, one of them is called the Musaf prayer. It was written by Rabbi Eliezer Kalir uh, in the 7th century. Part of this prayer reads as follows. Now follow this. The prayer says, Messiah, our righteousness is departed from us. Horror has seized us, and we have none to justify us. He has borne the yoke of our iniquities and our transgression, and was wounded because of our transgression. He beareth our sins on his shoulder, that he might find pardon for our iniquities. We shall be healed by his wound. At that time, the Eternal will create him, the Messiah, a, a new creature. O oh, bring him up from the circle of the earth, raise him up from the land of Seir, to assemble us on the Mount Lebanon, a second time by the power of Yinon. It's a bit of a mystical prayer, but the more you look at it, the more amazing it is. It speaks about uh, the Messiah being departed from his people, and then the Messiah taking upon himself the sins of the people, he, his vicarious suffering, his suffering on behalf of others. Then it speaks about the Messiah going away, which is part of their consternation, but coming back a second time and to bring uh, redemption. Much of this prayer is a quotation from Isaiah, chapter 53 in particular, and shows us as even as late as the 7th century, the Jewish view was still that this passage had reference to the Messiah. So what about more modern, modern interpretations? One can see that many ancient rabbis believed that Isaiah 53 was a prediction of a personal Messiah. So why do Jewish people today have so much problem believing this? Well, this is due to the interpretation given by uh, a well-known medieval scholar, famous Jewish scholar, Rabbi Shlomo Yitzhaki, also known as Rashi. And, of course, he was a Talmudic and biblical scholar in the 11th century. He adopted the idea that the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 was the nation of Israel who had suffered uh, at the hands of the Gentile nations. This is the interpretation that most modern rabbis continue to hold, that the suffering servant is Israel. However, the unreasonableness of Rashi's interpretation will become more apparent when we look at this passage more clearly and more closely. Furthermore, there were many rabbis even at the time of Rashi and after him that disagreed with him. One such rabbi was uh, Rabbi Moshe Kohn Eben Crispin of the 14th century who said that Rashi and his followers, now hear this, Rashi and his followers have distorted the passage from its natural meaning. He also said that this passage was given of God as a description of the Messiah to judge by the resemblance or non-resemblance to it whether he, that person, were the Messiah or not. What very interesting comments by Rabbi Moshe Cohen Eben Crispin. Also, in recent times, there have been many, uh, there's been quite a significant number of ultra-Orthodox Jews from the Chabad movement or the Lubavitch movement that believe that Isaiah 53 was speaking about the Messiah. They believed, of course, that their late Rebbe Menachem Mendel Schneerson was the Messiah, as I've spoken about in one of my earlier messages. He was the seventh and head rabbi of the movement. And so when Rebbe Schneerson fell ill due to a stroke, they believed he was fulfilling Isaiah 53. Here's a quote. The illness of the Mashiach is clearly foretold that by the prophet Isaiah in chapter 53. That was Shmuel Butman of Chabad. He was the chairman of the international campaign to bring Mashiach back, back in 1993. And also another quote. It is written that the Messiah will endure intense suffering before being revealed. That was Michael Wirt in the Seattle Post. 
back in 1993. However, it's probably true to say that the majority view today in Judaism is that Isaiah 53 is referring to the nation of Israel. That is why Rose Mayer from Rose Bay in New South Wales wrote several years ago in the Australian Jewish News. She was speaking about Messianic Jews when she said, finally they, Messianic Jews, hang their hat on the words of our prophet Isaiah. In chapter 53, he refers to the suffering servant, which is another reference to Israel. Messianics claim that the reference is to Jesus and therefore the prophecy was fulfilled. That is nonsense. We know that there is not one single reference to Jesus in the Jewish Bible. And we also know that our God, who went to such great pains to make the Torah an absolute perfect blueprint for every single aspect of our lives, would never have left out something so significant had it been the case. That, of course, was Rose Mayer from Rose Bay. Well, Mrs. Mayer, first of all, let me uh, say that um, we didn't make up the idea of Isaiah 53 being a reference to the Messiah. Virtually all Jewish sources, uh, ancient Jewish sources, refer to that. And secondly, for clarification, the book of Isaiah is not part of the Torah. It's part of the Nevi'im, the prophets. And so for this reason, we sometimes refer to Isaiah 53 as being the rabbi's conscience, the rabbi's conscience, for two reasons. Because of Rashi's controversial change of the interpretation of Isaiah that has now become the, accept, uh, the accepted interpretation, the norm. And also we believe it's uh, fair to apply this uh, idea of rabbi's conscience to Isaiah 53 because Interestingly and amazingly, Isaiah chapter 52 verse 13 all the way to chapter 53 verse 12 is left out of the annual cycle of reading in the Torah that we read and the Haftorah that we read uh, uh, annually and, and triannually. Why is Isaiah 52 13 to the end of chapter 53 left out? Very interesting. For this reason, we, some, some of us refer to this as the rabbi's conscience, left out on purpose. Now, to be fair, it's very hard for our people to believe in a suffering Messiah. And that's also because within the scriptures there is a messianic paradox, as it were. The same prophets that speak of the Messiah's suffering and substitutionary death also speak of the Messiah's exaltation and triumph and the conquering Messiah King. How can one man fulfill these contradictory predictions about the Messiah? Well, during the formation of the Talmud, our rabbis came up with a conclusion that there must be two different messiahs. The Messiah who has come, who comes to suffer and die for the sins of the people, is termed Messiah, son of Joseph, Mashiach ben Yosef. The second Messiah would then come following the first Messiah, and he would be Mashiach ben David. It would be the conquering king Messiah. And so for centuries, Orthodox Judaism has held the concept of these two Messiahs. However, since the Talmudic uh, period, the Messiah, son of Joseph, has been emphasized in the hearts and minds and imaginations of the Jewish people, while the role of the Messiah, son of Yosef, has been downplayed. Few know about this concept of the two messiahs until, in fact, the Lubavitch movement brought this back to the fore when they believed that their Rebbe was Mashiach ben Yosef when he suffered and died and that he would come back as Mashiach ben David. There was a big uproar in the Jewish community at that time. Perhaps that discussion is still going on. However, as Messianic Jews, we believe in only one messiah who has to come to earth twice. The first time he comes to fulfill the role of Mashiach ben Yosef, to suffer and die for the sins of the people. But he will come back a second time as Mashiach ben David, to be exalted as the conquering king and to bring peace to Israel and to the whole world. That is what we're looking forward to. Why did the Messiah have to die? Well, Isaiah the prophet explains it in a verse that I think sums up the whole message of the Messiah. In fact, I don't think anywhere in the Bible we will find a verse that describes 
the gospel as clearly. And if you wonder what the gospel is, this is what the gospel message really uh, is about. Isaiah 53, verses 5 to 6. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned, every one, to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That is the message of the gospel. We are all sinners. We have all fallen short of God's standards. We need the Messiah to come to bear our iniquities upon himself. If we don't have the Messiah to bear our iniquities, we have to bear them ourselves. And the result of sin is death. I would rather have the Messiah bear my iniquities, as the, as the prophet predicted. And this is picked up in the Brit Qadashah, in the New Testament, when Rabbi Shaul spoke to the Corinthians and he said to them about the Messiah, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is the whole message of the gospel right there as well. That God made the Messiah to become sin for us so that in relationship to the Messiah, in faith in the Messiah, we might be declared righteous before God. Something too that was clearly prophesied in Isaiah chapter 53. And so next week we'll have a closer look at this passage and I hope to exegete it verse by verse. And so uh, let's have a look at that in the coming uh, session as well. Let's just pray. Avinu Malkenu, our Father and our King, we thank you, Lord, that you have not left us in our sin without redemption, without a way of forgiveness, without atonement, and that, Lord, you had prophesied the Messiah would come and bear our iniquities upon himself. Lord, thank you for the sin bearer. I pray that you'd help us to understand the meaning of all this. I pray that you help more of my people to come and see Yeshua as the Messiah prophesied in the scriptures. And I pray that you help us to proclaim the good news to all that will listen. And so we pray for this, Lord, B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, and uh, help us to understand. Give us your Ruach HaKadosh to lead us into all truth. Open up our minds to the scriptures, we ask. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen.